All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and welcome to National Distance Learning Week, day two of our webinar series. Um, if you are just signing on, if you could just introduce yourself in the chat window, that lets us know where you're tuning in from. And this is the uh, first this week really international uh, session because Felice is over in Ireland. Um, so uh, your mics are muted as by default, but you can feel free to unmute them and have a conversation, ask questions of Felice as we go. National Distance Learning Week is something that is celebrated annually, and the idea here is to generate a greater awareness and appreciation for distance learning and also recognize leaders like Felice and best practices in our field. So Open SUNY aims to showcase this expertise uh, of those professionals who are engaged in this kind of day-to-day -day practice of distance learning. If we haven't met, my name is Erin Meany. I'm the Manager of Communications and Community Engagement at Open SUNY. And on behalf of the Open SUNY team, I want to welcome you to this showcase webinar. Today, we are pleased to host Felice Banner from uh, SUNY Polytechnic Institute, however, today over in Ireland, <laughs> sharing uh, highlights from the 28th uh, ICDE World Conference on Online Learning. So thank you for joining us uh, from Dublin. Felice is a learning experience design consultant with more than 25 years of vision, action, and leadership experience in transformational teaching and learning. She's an Adobe Education Leader, Certified Learning Environment Architect, and an STC Fellow. Felice, thanks for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Erin, and thanks everybody for coming to, uh, to meet now and also folks who are listening in later. And when Erin first put out the call, I thought, oh, I'd love to do a presentation, and then I realized I was going to be in Dublin. And then I thought, why not just talk about the highlights of, of the conference? And I was actually going to broadcast from the conference, but it was so crazy over there that I've come back to my, my apartment that, um, that I've I'm staying in, which is actually a historical landmark. Um, Marion Muse, you can look it up. The horses are downstairs. The police department has their horses downstairs. Uh, and it's, it's, nice and, it's actually nice and quiet, but if you hear something, it's the horses downstairs. It's exciting. So I'm here at the World Conference in Dis Online Learning, ICDE's World Conference in Online Learning, almost on a fluke. I do a lot of, um, I do, I am at SUNY Poly, I am a faculty member there in the uh, Information Technology, Information Design and Technology program, IDT program, master's program, and I'm also currently there working part-time uh, as an instructional designer to do course refresh, working with Rick Shelton and his, his group. And so I also do some work with the folks at Training Magazine, and they have this event called Innovations in Training. And they do innovations in training at the end of conferences, and it turns out they're doing it at the end of this conference, and they asked me if I wanted to come over to, to Dublin. So first it was, do I want to come to Dublin? Absolutely, <laughs> I want to come to Dublin. But then I saw which conference it was being tacked on, and I, um, I know Mark Brown, and, and I negotiated my, my way in um, and to attend the conference. It was late registration, but, uh, but I made it in and I'm so glad that I did. And when Erin talks about like best practices and practices that we all have in the work that we're doing, think about your own professional development. And I do a lot of presenting at conferences. I do a lot of giving of myself in, in these spaces. And very, I have very little time that I sit in a session or I just have the time to absorb. And so a lot of times the work that we do in instructional design, faculty development, you know, anything you're doing to support a campus in the design, development, delivery, and facilitation and management of online learning, we've got to remember to feed ourselves. And as I'm like feeding myself here in Ireland, not just in the pub, um, I, it just, it's like this incredible breath of fresh air, but my mind's going to explode. <laughs> but I highly recommend that we, you know, everyone find a way, build your network so that you have opportunities like this one that I've got right now. The sessions have, it started in the, every morning with these Taste of Ireland, and it's been, uh, you know, the Irish step dancing and, and music. And this morning, this, um, this quartet came to the stage, and they're speaking in Irish, and they're speaking in, uh, in English, and talking and teaching us about the music, not just playing, but teaching us about the music. And I, I think about, uh, our segues into, dis into courses and the way we design segues into courses. And to think about a learning experience that starts with 
you know, something enjoyable with something historical around it. But this notion of taste, I want you to hold that in your in the back of your mind. So what is that taste for something that we're doing? And uh, I came on a little early and was speaking to Aaron, but um, about this concept of story. And apparently the gentleman was talking earlier today, was it Aaron today? Yeah, about, about uh, narrative. And yesterday in the opening, there were, there were, you know, it's one thing to talk about the success of online learning or how many students are enrolled or, you know, how much even the profit of the institution or sustainability of the institution or scalability. But instead, they showcased, they focused on these three women whose lives were completely and absolutely changed and supported because they were able to, to go to school. And they were in, I'm not going to give you more because you can go watch all the videos. The recordings are there and I want you to go watch these recordings because their stories were so poignant and so strong. And really to think about you know, someone who's up against all of these barriers and all of these things that may have happened in life and never had the opportunity for that education, but now can have that education. And so I think about the things that draw us into to learn. So I'm looking at this whole experience from my perspective as now I'm in this immersive learning space. You've got me because you've given me this taste, right? And then you're telling me a story. I think these are lessons we can learn from the way this learning experience has been shaped. So I want to talk a little bit about the sessions that I've been to that have really truly resonated with me and perhaps we can have a discussion or you can think about um, ways. I would love it if you would share in the chat as, as we go through this, this. The first one that really <laughs> struck me was this notion of metaphors as investigative tools. And I did not really understand what the session was gonna be about. I thought it was gonna be something different and I loved this session. So um, the gentleman's name, oh boy, I'm gonna have to look that up. I have it somewhere, I have it on my phone. I have his Twitter address. Um, his, his approach was to take a look at, to do research by looking at metaphors around the learning management system, or as they say here, VLE, so LMS or VLE, virtual learning environment. And so their research was to find and do these, the anal these analyses on these metaphors that people use for the LMS. So if I were to say to you, you know, what is an LMS to you? Is it like, you know, it's an old broken box monster or something like that. So share in the chat, what is an LMS to you, right? So it's a, some of the things, and I want to talk about these three that, that he brought up. And it's interesting because you, the way they did their research, you can't just find, you know, a meta, you know, what is a metaphor for the learning management system? So the, the things that were coming up were, you know, uh, a, a broken down machine or, or a monster or an evil vampire that's sucking your blood, you know, and all of these things. And then he, he showed the, this slide and it's like, I can't remember who that research was from. I can look it up. I have, I have that picture on my phone, but this notion that, that it's like a school, a supermarket or an airport. And so the school, you come and grab, I don't know why these words, supermarket come and interact. I think it's the other way around. Supermarket is come and grab. School is come and interact. And airport come and be. Now, the one thing that I don't include in my bio always, but Aaron knows this, is I'm a pilot. I, I'm a private pilot. We have a little airplane. You just put airport up on the, on the, on the screen in a, in a presentation and you got me, right? And then he says, because in the learning management system, it's like going to the airport and you can look up on the, on the, the arrivals board and see what courses you might want to take. And you would, you know, go get on your plane and go on your journey. And I'm thinking an airport is not always a pleasant space, right? And what are things that happen in airports and where are all these controls? So now this notion of tying everything together, right? <laughs> of that taste, right? The notion of metaphor in, in this narrative that can come out in describing the, the experiences that our learners have, right? 
and maybe even using these metaphors to tap into other stories we can create to keep our learners involved. I'm going to talk more about that as we go along. Um, one of the strongest uh, metaphors that he was talking about was the silo. And I think for a lot of us across SUNY, this really, this really resonated with me because as strong as you know, our institutions are in their, in their learning. And I'm thinking about all of these silos of courses at all of our institution, and then thinking about the concept of SUNY online, right? And one repository and one place. And how are we going to manage that content exchange? How are we going to manage our student information systems? You know, all of these, these larger system questions are coming up in my mind. And I hope I don't get like, you know, <laughs> yelled at for, for mentioning this concept, but I do. I see, I see all of our, our, in, our universities and our, our colleges, community colleges, they're, they're little silos. And can we bid, build bridges between those silos? Do we need to drain the silos and you know, come up with a new structure or something like that? So he's thinking on the silos. And the, the, there was a great one about how it's like a minivan. The LMS is like a minivan where everybody's got one, but you're embarrassed to have it parked in your backyard, in your driveway. And then Phil Hill came up with this notion that it's a school bus. And it's like, you have no control of where you're going. You got to get on it. It's going to go without you, whether you're on it or not, you know, to get somewhere. So these, this, this session really, it just resonated with me. It was tapping into those stories. I thought it was a completely different session. When he first started, I was so disappointed. And of course, I'm sitting in the third row and I can't get up and leave. But, um, but think about that and think about, you know, how we could learn more through metaphor, possibly. So going on, um, what I, one of the things that I really love to see is folks from around the world presenting on different topics. So whether it was about learner engagement or about um, uh, even scaling programs or about faculty support, the Community of Inquiry Framework came up from people all around the world. So people from Africa, South Africa, from uh, Malaysia and of course Canada, they, the, the community of inquiry framework is still coming out. And what is shocking to me are people who don't know what that is. So a lot, there are, you know, as I think it's a part of everything, you know, for me, it's a part of everything I do. And it's a lot of what comes out of SUNY is, is really focused on the community of inquiry framework. Just checking that chat there. So, oh, perfect. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Erin. So, um, but like to see it come up in these, in, in, it's great because Norm Vaughn did a presentation and the woman after him, half of her presentation was showing Norm Vaughn's research. <laughs> so she was like, I don't have to show you this now. And she was from South Africa. I don't have to show you this now. I can talk more about, about my problem. And, and this, this was a, this really resonated for me. I didn't know until about halfway through her session that her boss was sitting right next to me. And I need to point out one thing about these sessions. They are an hour and I think it's yeah, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes long or an hour and a half long, but there are four or five sessions in there. So you get about 10 minutes to present and then one minute for questions. And that format has just made it so vibrant. It's vibrant to be in any space. Because if you're in that session, like I was in that session and the gentleman was talking about metaphors and it, it turned out to be fantastic. But I was like, oh my God, I'd have to leave it for the whole session for an hour and a half. And these smaller chunks of information, I feel like they're modeling what we're doing in our space at this conference. So this woman is talking about the challenges. So she's just presenting on the challenges and hoping that there can be a conversation about around solutions that people could offer. They have um, a very large university. I did not copy down the numbers and I, I, I apologize for that, but there were some numbers that stood out to me. So with maybe a hundred, maybe uh, it's over a thousand students. So it might be like 20,000 students in this one course and this one track, it's not even a course, it's a couple of courses. And, um, and the relation, the number, look at that. So they have 60 tutors. And so it's six times six, so it's 3,600 students. Um, 60 tutors, 
um, I think seven faculty serving all of these students and they were they had the cap at 200 students to one tutor which I think is high right I think 200 to one is high so every faculty member right the faculty are teaching a course the course has a course tutor and it somehow that 200 number that was in policy disappeared and now these tutors have over 600 students and the tutors what her study was on was the faculty perception of the tutors and the tutor satisfaction with the work they're doing and how because her focus is on growing the she was a tutor herself at one point now she's a, a department she's head of like faculty development and um and it's it it's just like to me that's frightening right <laughs> can you imagine taking care of 600 students and i know whoever one of you is at empire state college right and so you do mentoring there right and so how many students what's your max student come on your here can you unmute oh we can't hear you Let's see. Is there any way we can hear? Well, if we can't hear, go ahead and type how in about, the chat. How about now, Lois? Oh, okay. Check? There we <laughs> go. <laughs> Here I am. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I I just started in July, and I'm an instructional designer. So yeah, yeah. But look, can you imagine? Like, I can't even imagine 200 students, yeah, and know. and then. And so the isolation, I mean, the, the words that were coming out of her mouth about these tutors, isolation, frustration, and, you know, we think about faculty support and student support, and now you've got tutor support on top of it. So she's trying to find ways to, you know, build community around, among these tutors and um and her the the woman next to me she she turned because i'm like oh my god <laughs> she turned to me and she said the policy was 200 and now all of a sudden it's 600 and and the tutors stay on and yes they're paid but i just i just i can't imagine it and so of course in my head i immediately start designing a solution right how to how to train the tutors how to support the tutors how much money we're going to need how much candy we're going to need you know all of these things so um, I had a lovely conversation with her afterwards and um, she's talking, she's looking for very inexpensive solutions, right? And so I thought about the, you know, I told her about the, um, the Open SUNY Facebook group and how that's working, right? And how there are smaller groups in there. So, um, so maybe that will, be, that will be helpful to her. So we've got 10 minutes, a little more than 10 minutes left and Simon Nelson was the plenary this morning. And wow, right? So yesterday, wow, with these stories. And today, um, he, Simon is with Future Learn. And Future Learn is like the, it's a simple way to say it, it's like the MOOC arm of uh, Open University when it first started. Now they're partnering with other folks. They have millions of students. They have um, thousands of courses and, uh, the the conversation was so dynamic i have an entire notebook filled with um with just things that i was writing as he was speaking and he was talking about the huge need that that we have for access to learning and online learning is the only place this is going to happen right and studies of uh brick and mortar universities asked if um i think it was one of the mckinsey reports do you think uh, brick and mortars will be offering online courses, you know, traditional ones in 2030? And in the in the U.S. responses were still, you know, yeah, they'll be they'll be doing it, but they don't want to. Like, is it is it valid? Is it is it there? Just crazy data um, that I'm going to go back and take a look at. But he talks about the the vast demand for high quality work and the things. This is it. What's going to make a difference are the speed that you're able to go in shaping your programs and the boldness that you're willing to employ or embody. And I, I think about that in our space and a lot of us that have, 
that were there in the very beginning. It was it was about boldness, right? It's what are we willing to do? What what chances are we willing to take and make? And uh, a lot of what he was talking about was this notion of building these pathways of lifelong learning, and that stackable, chunkable courses, and that you're in a short course, and then you're in a, a main, you know, a certificate, a small certificate, a, then a graduate certificate, or a diploma, and then a degree, and sort of build how you build on these with these open courses. And what really hit me was when he showed another slide. I didn't get it fast enough. I didn't take a picture of it but it was a listing of their courses and what they are. And then he did a, uh, just showed their, their, their portal. And it was, a, a have a taste. And I'm like, back to the taste of Ireland again, here we go. But these organizations, whether it's, you know, the, whether the entire MOOC is free, you know, the whole MOOC, the MOOC's free, a certificate is free, whatever this is, there is always something free that I can taste and see what I want. And if you think about working folks who want to take courses, right, or want to do a program, but they're not sure, is it gonna be good enough? Am I really interested? Is this where I wanna go? What are we giving them for free? What do we give our students for free? When we design a course in a learning management system that's in a silo, right, what are we giving them outside the silo before they get in that they will always have? Ray Schroeder talked about semester without end so many years ago. It's like so that all the that learners, once they leave the learning management system, will still have something when when they're when they're done. All of this stuff is is really going on in my head. This this notion of uh, of a free taste, and so. The next session I went to today, I've got a star next to this because this was just stellar, absolutely stellar. And two young women from, I think, University of Michigan, Upper Michigan, uh, did, are doing a study, and they're not, they're not done, on care and rigor in online learning. And so um, the first thing was getting a little group, right, in your little row, and define care and define rigor. What is care? What is rigor? And so our group was international. And one of the women was from uh, Brazil. She only, she spoke a little bit of English, a very good, you know, very good English. But she didn't couldn't have a, she didn't have a word for what she was trying to describe. And the word that she said, and I'm going to botch it here, continencia, continencia is the, what she was trying to say. She kept doing this with her arms for care. And when the presenter said, you know, what did your groups discuss? And I'm like, you gotta hear from this one. <laughs> like, try to explain this. And it's basically a vase. And this notion that we're holding our students, we're caring for our students, but there are boundaries. There's a wall of some sort and there's support and there can be beauty in that. But the, what happened was, as these two words are up on the screen, probably 90% of the room could define care, but not rigor. And our concepts of rigor, and you know, they, they've got the Higher Learning Commission, uh, that their uh, accreditation is with, and that rigor is in there, and your online courses, we've all heard this, right? So is your online program as rigorous as your face-to-face -face program, or your online courses as rigorous, or your standards as rigorous? And so what their study has found with the faculty and the students defining, and I did have some more slides, and I didn't put them up, but I am just going to look at them real quick so I can read these out to you, because they're very faint. For the students, they, they did word clouds from their, their surveys. Rigor, the word, the biggest word that came out was assignment. Material, class, expectations, work, discussion. And for care, questions, email, feedback, responses. And then for faculty, for instructors, rigor was feedback, responses, email, questions. And care was assignment, student learning expectations. 
And what they really came to see was that by defining each of these terms, they couldn't really pull them apart from the faculty perspective or the student perspective. And that for faculty who uh, who really focus on, you know, what is rigor, it's this combination of rigor and care. And so how do we care about our students? And when we design working with faculty, I, and this is something, you know, I, I encourage all of you, all of us, I'll do it too, is to ask faculty, how would you define each of these? How do you, how would you define care? How would you define rigor? or maybe come up with words that, that you would like to explore, going back to that, you know, something as metaphor. But I have a big problem with the term engagement. And we talk about, you know, fostering engagement in the online space. But what does engagement mean? And so uh, talking with Angela Gunder from uh, University of Arizona, she says they use the word engagement because they define the word engagement. So before they even like say, we're going to have you know, more engagement, what does that mean? And the institution has an acceptable definition for that word. And what if we were to have an acceptable definition of the word rigor? What would that mean? And how would we guide faculty? How can we involve faculty in the definition of these, these types of terms, right? Um, so this is all my brain, you guys. <laughs> this is my brain dump. But this really, really struck a chord with me. Um, and, and as Aaron said, it's connecting the brain to the heart. Stories connect the brain to the heart. And that's what the presenter said earlier, right, Aaron? And so this is... Uh, another way to consider what we're doing connecting to the heart and having a passion for teaching and learning, caring for our students and, and blending that, that care and rigor. So I got a shout out to Bill Pels here. So Bill, if you're listening and watching our video, um, there was a gentleman who gave a phenomenal presentation on chaos and establishing sort of a chaotic leadership perspective in a leadership class and designing, intentionally designing his course uh, with a hudagogical approach where the students are empowered to find their own learning pathway, uh, to determine the learning content that, that they would explore. And, um, and so we had a lot of time left in that session. So I did, I, I, I quoted Bill Pels and brought up the concept of techno hudagogy and uh, how technology, how we're using technology to enable our students to create their own learning pathways uh, in this space. I have to say, uh, his name, first name was Jason. I don't remember his last name and I'm not, I, I'm sorry, I'm not giving you everybody's names here, but you can watch recordings online. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't think the little presentations are, but the big ones, but uh, he had written a paper and he read his paper. And I, you know, I say this all the time. It's like, oh, you're going to go into, sorry about that. You're going to go into a session. Oh, sorry. You're going to go into a session and here are my, the rest of my slides. So where are we? Here we go. So um, I'm, I can't find my PDF here. We go. Sorry. Give me one second. So, um, just thinking about, uh, you know, he's reading his paper, and I have to say, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, sometimes some of some of us, you know, me. Well, I can't say me. <laughs> so, if you're uncomfortable presenting, but you know you can write, there's nothing wrong with reading that paper when it's, you know, it's just so well written and it's sharing. And his whole concepts came out. And and his the it wasn't about research. It wasn't referred to, you know, Pell's chapter three. It really was his his inspiration, and it was it was absolutely beautiful. Um, and then I talk about opportunity here. I had, I got to present today. So uh, Angela Gunder is a friend of mine. She was presenting on using improv in student development. And I got to do the improv session. I got to be the yes, but yes. And you know, no, we can't do this, but you know, and, um, and then the yes and, and talk about possibility. So that was a lot of fun presenting. And, um, and then, I 
went through the exhibit hall uh, right before lunch and I met some really interesting vendors that are doing really cool stuff that I'll explore a little bit more. And the folks were there from, uh, one of the catalysts was there and they, they're a Moodle supporter. And I'm thinking, what happened to Moodle, right? And what's happening with Moodle and what's happening in this LMS space. And um, D2L is here and Canvas and just thinking again about what's happening with our learning management system. And one of, the th one of the things that I would really like to do is to find a way, even if we're in the constraints of this LMS, whether it's Moodle, Blackboard, or you know, D2L, Canvas, whatever it is next year or the year after, can we do this without creating silos that will limit us in this space? Can we do this so that we can share? Can, you know, open pedagogy, I consider, and Erin, you can do this better than me on open pedagogy, but you know, if our students are contributing and we're creating open content, where is that open content? And how do we do it inter-academy? How do we do it from you know, UMUC and SUNY? How do we do it from SUNY institution to SUNY institution? How do we do it with the University of South Africa? And I know lots of people are doing, you know, making these partnerships and creating this content. So um, next up for me, as I said before, innovations and training, it starts on Thursday. We are going to, um, to partner with Trinity. We're gonna be over at Trinity College. We're gonna take a look at a lot of uh, design thinking approaches in teaching and learning and some other unique technologies. And I'm actually presenting on augmented reality and virtual reality. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. And I highly, you know, I highly recommend going on, doing a search on the ICDE World Conference on Online Learning. Right off the homepage is the YouTube channel for that. And the, the keynotes are stored there. Take a look at the, the stories from yesterday, the, the conversation from today and tomorrow. Um, we're here till Thursday, you know, Thursday morning. There's more plenaries going on. And thank you so much, Erin, for letting me share my brain. I hope that folks enjoy this, at least if I can spark some interest and get you thinking about, you know, what it means to have that taste of something beforehand. You know, what are, what are we giving our students for free where they don't have to do anything and they're going to enjoy it? Absolutely. Thanks, Felice. I did put the, the link to the conference Great. in the chat um, and to, to some more uh, wisdom and knowledge from Bill on uh, mm. one, one of our recordings from him where he talks about Hidagoji um, and a couple other th links that are in there. So they'll be captured in the recording for all of you as well. Um, this was recorded and we will um, be posting that to the um, same site where we have done all of our advertising. I put that in the chat as well. Um, so we want to make sure that you have that. And I also encourage you to take a look at the usdla.org mm -hmm. website. They um, sponsor National Distance Learning Week and have uh, webinars from across the globe uh, this week. So lots of fun stuff and also things at all different kinds of times of the day, um, as Felice knows very well, <laughs> being mm -hmm. over there, 5 p.m. In, in, or 5.30 p.m. in Dublin. So I appreciate uh, your time and your attention, your participation. If there are any questions, um, you know, I'll... I'll hold this open for, but I do know because of time, if anybody needs to go, that's totally fine as well. So just to hold Felice for a moment longer in case there are questions. I did not see anything um, in the chat specifically, but these are great insights and, you know, they always spark, any conversation I have with you sparks me thinking about all kinds of things. So I, I love that and I've taken notes. <laughs> well, excellent, excellent. And um, so, yeah, if, if I can stay on for another minute or so, some of the things that I'm, I'm really looking at now is the notion of uh, liminal space in, the online, in online learning. And liminal space in architecture is, is a pass-through. So it's a doorway or a door frame, uh, the anything, any area that you pass through. Liminality is a concept in, in psychology and sociology. Uh, you know, it's, it's a threshold or, or something you pass, a way that you pass through before something happens. And uh, I think about uh, these interim spaces that our students are in, our learners are in, in, in an online course. So even when you finish a page and there's a next or back button, that's a liminal moment or a liminal space. And so this, this concept of engagement to me is 
you know, we take our learners on a journey, but how are we constructing these walkthroughs, these pass throughs? And, you know, I think of <laughs> my brain is all over the place. So if you want to stop the recording, you can, Aaron. <laughs> but I think about, you know, a, a religious space or in, in, in they do a lot of architecture around liminal space in, in religious spaces. So that like, for me, there's a mezuzah on my door and, and I walk through the house and that's a, a meaning and, and you stop and you think and there's an action. And then, you know, when you walk into a church, the space is set up a specific way and, you know, you take an action, whether you're, you know, think, but, but religion has, does a lot architecturally with liminal space and museums do a lot also.